Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to this portion of this week's study. As we continue through the 11th chapter of Daniel, shall we again praise our Heavenly Father for all of his blessings and for his watch care over all things that he is doing in our lives? Then shall we join together in prayer so that we may more clearly be blessed by the things that he would have us to understand? Shall we now bow our heads in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We know that we each have battles. There are many things that are going on today, Father. I lift up my brothers, each one. Kelly, William, Theodore, Iran, all that are joined in this message. We are all under attack today, Father, from within and from without. We know our need of you. We ask now, Father, that you guide us and you direct us in this study, in our lives, in all that are going th- that we are going through. Help us today that as we open your word, we might find that which we need for this day so that your will may be done in our lives, so that your will will also be done <clears throat> as we go forward to give a message that you would have us to give. We now pray for your blessing, for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, for the protection of your angels, and for wisdom to rightly divide this word, this word of truth. Help us to this end. Direct us now, we pray, in all things. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Yesterday we were leaving off with verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Smith's comment here is those that forsake the covenant, the holy scriptures, and think more of the decrees of popes and the decisions of councils than they do of the word of God. These shall be, these shall he, the pope, corrupt by flatteries. That is lead them on in their partisan zeal for himself by the bestowment of wealth, of position, and of honors. Now, is this only applied for a time in the past? Or can this be applied to us today? Well, well, we, we first you know, apply it to the past because it's a specific uh, prophecy. Uh, but we know that history is going to be repeated is going to be as in the future or is being repeated now as in well, the present? Well, both. But but this history is dealing with the Sunday law. So, I mean, we're sort of in the time of the Sunday law, obviously, since 9-11. So, so we had interpreted, we had made an application to the Sunday law. Um, so, so those that do wickedly against the covenant... We looked at the Sunday law in 538, but we, we applied to the Sunday law in our time as well. And then the he is the papacy. It is the spiritual king of the north. Now, we put here in our application, we put the USA. Now, this goes to this discussion that uh, Colin and Jeff had, this disagreement of sorts, where... We recognize that it's the United States that brings in the Sunday law, that the papacy doesn't bring in the Sunday law, correct? We have discussed that, yes. Yeah. I mean, and it's pretty clear in the spirit of prophecy that, that this is an image to the beast, an image of the beast. Um, it is not the beast itself that, that gives the mark of the beast. It's the United States that uses this symbol of papal supremacy, though it's not generally understood by people who are going to keep Sunday that that they're actually um, that this is the mark of papal authority. Right. That would be the idea that we have as Adventists about the Sunday law. Now, one of the questions that I've had to ask myself multiple times in going through this, the prior verse verse 31. Mm -hmm. I'll bring this up here in just a second. Since we're doing a continuation, 
excuse me. It reads, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, is the they that they're asking, that they're stating in this, that pollute the sanctuary of strength, and that take away the daily, is this related in any way to those that establish the vision that we find in verse 14? Okay, um, so in so Rome establishes the vision, right? Right, correct. And um, so we're going to have the ones that take away the daily is is these um, these tribes that now they're they're going to be pagan tribes, right? You know, I mean, the, the Germanic tribes are pagan, right? They're not Christian, but they're going to become Christian, right? And we're saying that the daily is paganism. Right. And and we have pagan Rome. Pagan Rome has to be removed in order for papal Rome to be set up. Right. That's the idea in Second Thessalonians chapter two. OK, because they're going to hinder. Uh, the rise of the papacy. The papacy is is paganism baptized or paganism in Christian garb. There's different ways in which it's described. It it really is paganism, but it doesn't look like paganism. It doesn't have animal sacrifices, and it, it has all these Christian trappings, so to speak, even though they're not really Christian. Um, so the question is, who takes away the daily? Right. Now, it's not papal Rome that takes away the daily. No. Right. So, so papal Rome itself doesn't do that. And in in Second Thessalonians, when it talks about this, um, where it says in verse seven of chapter two, Second Thessalonians two seven, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now, the mystery of iniquity is, um, in this context, going to be referring to the papacy, right? Okay. That's how we would understand it, that this is the mystery of iniquity. You know, it has to do with the Antichrist. So that's the papacy. The mystery of iniquity is not paganism, right? It's papalism. It's connected to papalism. Would we agree with that? I would say that we would have to. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and we can connect. Yeah. Okay. And we connect that to verse 32 of Daniel 11 and such as do wickedly against the covenant. Right. So we, we could see that this mystery of iniquity and those that do wickedly against the covenant are the same, same thing, just described in different words. Okay. Okay. And. But it says only he who now letteth, well, the word letteth means hindered or withholdeth. It's the same one where it says in verse six, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So he says, you know what is withholding that he, that is the man of sin, the son of perdition, might be revealed in his time. So Paul is saying, you you know what that is, right? That's going to be. Rome, right? Pagan Rome is what is withholding or that is hindering the the man of sin. So he says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, but only he who now withholdeth will, will continue to do so until he be taken out of the way. So so we know that it has to be taken out of the way. That what's taken out of the way is Rome. So it can't be Rome itself that removes itself. It can't be papal Rome that removes Rome, and it can't be pagan Rome removing itself. So the they has to be something else other than pagan Rome or papal Rome. Would we agree with that? How do others see this? Can we agree with this point? I'm just looking at the the Hebrew grammar here. Uh, just to, because you're going to have... Uh, trying to figure this this part out well you're doing that i've got to take care of something very quickly i'll be right back 
So I'm, I'm looking at this, these two verses together. So we know that arms shall stand on his part. Now, I'm looking at Young's literal translation. It says, and strong ones out of him shall stand up and have polluted the sanctuary, the stronghold, and have turned aside the continual and appointed the desolating abomination. And those acting wickedly, uh, he puts against in uh, italics, uh, wickedly against the covenant. He defileth by flatteries, and people knowing their God are strong and have wrought. Now, now Young's may be literal in some ways, um, but I don't actually think it's it's a good translation um, because I believe that Young is interpreting in this this in the context of Atticus Epiphanes and so forth and that history that interpretation because we know that arm shall stand on his part so the his is going to be the papacy right and and he has and strong ones out of him stand up which is quite different. Uh, than the King James. Um, so so arm shall stand on his part and he shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, which we're going to say is 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 dealing with Rome and have um, and they're going to take away the daily and give the abomination of desolation. Now he has he's going to turn aside the continual, which really doesn't make sense. So it, even though Young's claims to be literal, and he is in a lot of cases, he's not always correct. So, uh, so this word "take away" is "sir." Now, it it does. Uh, um, it, it would be more better to translate this as "take away" than as "turn aside." Um, so he's going to take away the daily. This is where. Um, we're going to have these things of taking away, connecting to Second Thessalonians. So that's the way that we look at it. Um, so the ones that take away the daily are the arms that stand on his part. So that's going to be Clovis. So it is true when we look at the history of 508 that Clovis stands on the part of the papacy, correct? That Clovis is going to be the one that stands on the part of the papacy but those are the arms that are referred to okay i mean i mean is there anywhere any way else that we could see this i don't see how we could see it any other way if we're going to apply this to the history from 508 to 538 so i was going through stephen's paper on 508 and definitely there is all of these wars that clovis is involved in so that they has to refer to the arms right in in uh and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. That's going to be the arms that stand on his part, on the part of the papacy. So the question is, such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries? Um, but the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So we're going to have to say that they is the armies of Clovis, that this is France. Now, and we know now, you know, and I always say that it's France that puts the papacy on the throne of the earth. Now, we know that it's going to be Justinian, right, who's going to to have the Sunday law. And he's not French. No. But but without France, we don't really have any of this happen, right? If I understand the history correctly. Without France... Uh, standing on the part of the papacy, we would not have the papacy set on the throne of the earth in 538. That's that's what we would have to demonstrate, that this is not just some incidental event, that it is actually the primary event, is the conversion of Clovis and the battles that Clovis is involved in. Stephen, you have any thoughts on that? If you're available. Yes, I would uh, agree. I can't see any other kind of interpretation which would, uh, I think, be satisfactory in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, from what I've looked into it, you know, I, I just think the baptism of Clovis just sets a precedent for kings giving their power to the papacy the following mm -hmm. during the 1260. 
So yeah. it is a, is a world changing event. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and, and we need to recognize, you know, how prophecy works, why these things are being presented to us. Because uh, one is their typical events. That is, these, these events that have been happening in Daniel chapter 11, we've seen their typical nature. We see that they have all of this symbolism attached to them. That is, the Daniel 11 isn't just a bunch of history about things that happened. They're, they're, they're typical events of things that are going to happen. That's why Ellen White says the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. But also that, that God isn't just choosing, you know, some events for their typical nature. They actually are also transformative events in history that these these are the events that that give history its direction it's leading to something and we can see that in how these different things are are described where they go through this repeat and enlarge you know they're going to talk about uh, the destruction of jerusalem then they're going to go back and give the cause why jerusalem is destroyed well it's because of this league that was made right 1,335 years after the first league, right? So we can see where the 1,335 comes from. That's later applied. So anyway, Dwight, you got further thoughts on this? Well, as we're, you know, as we're considering this, we bring this in again back with, with Daniel 11.32. And if we use the alternate reading out of the Oxford Revised, we would have it say, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he cause to dissemble by flatteries. Shall he cause to hide his true motives? Now, I don't know how that works with the Hebrew, but we know that the papacy works behind the scenes. They work in darkness. They do not want to reveal their true motives. Yeah, and, and we have to think about that. Like, even at this time, is the papacy's goal at that time? So, because, you know, how how far reaching or far thinking is the papacy's goals? You know, it, it just kind of reminds me of, I was watching, and I've mentioned this before, but I was watching this video. This guy deals with, uh, you know, how to become like, you know, a more assertive person and different personality characteristics, you know, how to reach your goals. And, and he has some interesting videos. Um, and, and he will sometimes use examples. He uses this one example from uh, the movie The Godfather, which I've never seen, so I don't know much about it. I just know it's about the mafia. And uh, Marlon Brando's in it, I think. Right? So, Correct. I don't remember. But anyway, in... In in the movie, and I don't know much about the plot, but he ends up having some kind of meeting with all these other gang leaders of different mafia groups or whatever. And, you know, he doesn't show his hand. So I don't I don't quite understand the whole strategy of it, but something to do with the fact that he, he makes himself look weak. But but he has a longer term goal in mind which was basically to destroy all of the other people. So he makes some alliances, but, you know, they're not true alliances, right? Um, you know, and again, I, you know, since I've never watched the movie, I don't really understand. But from what the guy explained is, is the idea that you don't let people know what your true intentions are. You can manipulate them with, with false intentions, right? And that, and he says something which which I I've, I've heard from you know Dr. Jordan Peterson and something I I've learned myself is that the results that occur um when when somebody is you know in control and power are the results that they want not the results that they say they want so people will you know say you know we want to do this and here is our goal uh, but they keep getting results that are different than what their stated goal is. And that's because their stated goal isn't really their stated goal. It's the results that they get that is their stated goal. 
and and other people could look at it and say, well, we don't see how you know their goal is going to be reached uh, by what they're saying that they're doing. Um, you know, an example would be in Canada. You know, Justin Trudeau talked about how you know we're going to, you know, we're going to tax everybody heavily and spend lots of money, and and we're going to get out of debt that way. You know, and Canada is going to be really strong economically. And of course, that didn't happen. But what happened was actually his goal. He was he was intending to destroy the economy, right? So because their belief is, you know, our economy is too strong and it creates pollution, at least, you know, in his sort of juvenile way of thinking, he, he thinks that that's good if people are poor. Uh, but he's not going to tell tell people that he wants them to be poor, right? So the point is that here we have the papacy acting in a way that is actually or, or or saying things that really have nothing to do with their goals. So they they have allied themselves with political powers, but they actually have a, a goal that if they were to tell the people that they're allied with what their goals really are, they, they wouldn't have an alliance with them. I know that's a really roundabout way of saying this, but but this is what was happening with the papacy. Is the papacy, its goals are are hundreds of years in the future. They're not immediate. That is, they will they will do all kinds of things in the immediate time that they say are their goals, but they're not really their goals at all. So they are masters of of what would be called the long game. Yeah, yeah, the long con or something like that. So, and and so we would know that Satan is really ultimately behind this, because you can't imagine a person having such a long term plan, definitely for his own interest, and and he wouldn't know what that plan could be. There's no way that that an individual could plan for, you know, a couple of thousand years, uh, his goals or goals of an institution. Right. This is there's more than just an ideology that Satan is is really been behind this whole thing. Right. Um, of the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church has all kinds of positions at different times. Uh, but there is this long unstated goal. Which is really Satan's goal, his plan. And so the papacy is going to have the United States and spiritualism really fulfill its goal under under false pretenses so so if we deal with the idea who's who's the king of the north i've accepted that the king of the north at this time is rome okay well really christ is the king of the north the true he's, king of the north he's, yeah. he's the true king of the north right satan has usurped christ's throne right the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north all right. Well, that's the table. Of the show well, right. I, I was, I would say he's usurped Adam's throne rather than Christ, because uh, Adam has to be a, a co-regent. So Christ is yeah. still the king. He hasn't been usurped. Yes. Okay. I would agree. But 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 that's what he is seeking. He's seeking to take his throne. Right. That's um, yeah. Um, let me see here. Yeah, so Isaiah 14, verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So when when we when we look at this whole idea of the man of sin, of the papacy, it's really this is is Satan seeking to usurp Christ's throne, right? I think that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, and in Isaiah 14, verse 12, it says, you know, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How art thou cut, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? So one of the things about Lucifer is he wants to weaken or overthrow or destroy it comes from a word to prostate, prostrate, pardon me, overthrow, decay, discomfort, waste away, weaken, 
right? So he's going to weaken the nations, right? So Satan is this, this whole purpose of the man of sin is really to destroy the earth, right? Because that's, that's Satan's plan. And he wants to destroy the earth and he wants to have heaven, right? He wants to be in charge. And so the self-exaltation, you know, that we see in papacy is just the spirit of Satan. And it's really about Satan, not about any particular pope exalting himself, right? Okay. Right, because the popes themselves, I mean, do you think that the pope himself cares about worldly glory? Is, is that the purpose of the pope as an individual? I don't think so. No. So, so I mean, he's just an ideologue. He has he has a goal, which is really not his own, right? Because I mean, there's obviously different popes, and they would have different attitudes. But you know, you can't imagine they're all just you know extreme narcissists. Uh, they actually have a belief system. So when we know when it talks in Second Thessalonians about um, you know, um, let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's Isaiah 14, verse 13. Right? All right. So, that, so that's not a person that is Satan. So I, I think we can all agree with that, right? This isn't anything new. But often we get caught in, in this of just thinking about the Pope himself or the papacy as an idea you know, or the Catholic Church as an institution. So so there's a thing that, that hinders this, right? And that thing that hinders or withholdeth has to be taken out of the way. And then, you know, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Right. So, so we can see how that relates to Daniel chapter 11 Verse 32, that, that Paul is definitely has this in mind. Okay. Smith continued. <clears throat> At the same time, a people shall exist who know their God. And these shall be strong and do exploits. These were those who kept the pure religion alive in the earth during the dark ages of papal rule and perform marvelous acts of self-sacrifice and religious heroism in behalf of their faith. Prominent among these stand the Waldenses, Albigenes, Huguenots, etc. Now, I find it intriguing when I went through this to put together different portions on Daniel 11.32 that in Scripture, the majority of the referred verses from Daniel 11.32 were strictly from the book of Maccabees. So when they were talking about those that do wickedly against the covenant, they referred to 1 Maccabees 1, 43 and 52, which would read, Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. And then, and many of the people were gathered unto them to quit everyone that forsook the law, so they committed evils in the land. I think what they were trying to show is that many of those at that time that lived in Judea had chosen to walk different paths. Now, of course, that's going to be dealing with the history of the Tychus Epiphanies, right? That's why they're, they're making that application there. Well, it's also not just with Antiochus Epiphanes, but even before that. Yeah, 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 exactly. 
but but in that history, that's what they're trying. That's because they have an interpretation that they're going to have Antiochus the fourth as a fulfillment of these uh, this section of Daniel eleven. Now, okay. um, now Parminder he tried to to make an argument, and this would have been in two thousand. I think it was in early 2019. I don't think it was earlier. That uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is is applicable uh, to these sections. Now he, he's sort of making the same uh, argument that um, Desmond Ford was making in understanding oh, Daniel 11, that he takes sort of a preterist view, and that that any other view we have is actually an application later on. I don't know if people are familiar with what Carminder was doing. But there's no way that we can apply this history to Antiochus Epiphanes. No, there isn't. Right. And so, you know, we can't, you know, is there parallels that you could get sort of looking back in this earlier history? Because history always repeats itself. You know, maybe, maybe you could. But it's pretty clear that the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate is not the history of Atticus Epiphanes. You know, we're not in the history of Greece here. We're in the history, you know, like basically we're what, how many years later? Um, you know, 700, 800 years later, right? 600, yeah, 700 years later. Make sense? Now, what was 700 years later? Well, this here, this history of the taking away of the daily is like six more than almost 700 years after the time of the Tychus Epiphanes. Okay. Right. So, so the translators are applying this still to Greece. They haven't moved to Rome in their interpretation of Daniel 11. But we're, we're not applying this to the time of Tychus Epiphanes. We're applying it to the time of Rome. Okay. Right. Rome moving from pagan into papal. So the such as do wickedly against the covenant, we see as the Sunday law in 538 under Justinian. And then it's the papacy that corrupts by flatteries. And then we have the people that know their God. Those are going to be the Waldenses, right? And those different groups in the wilderness, right? The 144,000 is going to be the parallel to our time. Um, but in that time, it's it's going to be uh, the people that are persecuted during that period. And they're going to be sp- strong and do, but as the faithful followers of God will remain faithful, preach the truth, and win many converts. That's that's how we understand the historical application of that, verse 32. So, so the application to Maccabees that the translators use, they don't apply to these to these verses. Okay. Now, with verse 33, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. Here Smith makes the application, the long period of papal persecution against those who were struggling to maintain the truth and instruct their fellow men in ways of righteousness is here brought to view. The number of the days during which they were thus to fall is given in Daniel 7, 25, 12, 7, Revelation 12, 6, 14, and 13, 5. Now, is Smith confusing history here? Here we have Daniel eleven thirty three. 33. Yet he wishes to relate this with Daniel 7, 25 and Daniel 12, 7. Yeah, so so yeah, he doesn't he thinks Daniel twelve seven is the same period as, as seven twenty five, which it's not. Now, one of the things when we went through this before that were noted was that Ellen White had very few comments that she made directly making use of anything in Daniel eleven. But yet verses 32 and 33 are one of those rare cases. Manuscript 174 of 1903, 
paragraphs 26 and 27 have a very direct reference to exactly what we're reading here. Since this is, was one of the non-published documents, it reads as follows. They have educated the negative until the Lord says the negative of the graces of the Holy Spirit you shall have with all their consequences unless you repent. There are those who are choosing the evil and educating themselves in character little by little until the taste and habits are gradually corrupted, that their own human defects remain in them unchanged. They would have none of the Lord's reproofs. They found some expressions they could interpret and explain in their own way and sow the seeds of doubt until this was their food. Unbelief spiced everything that they should have received as truth. But the messages will come to the churches because there are precious souls deceived and still being deceived by their deceptive course of action. Daniel 11, 32 and 33. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now, there are many things that we need to look at at regarding this portion here we do have an application that is soon to occur because while we can look historically at this with verse 33 i think we also have to look within what's very soon to come upon the world for part of this with verse 33 yeah, well, because we have the here, the wise says they that understand, but it's really the wise, um, right? The wise shall understand, right? So that so in in our application for now, that's the hundred and forty four thousand. That's that's how we would apply it, and and then they're going to have um, so in Hebrew, so you have the word people there. Right, which is the word am, right, which often refers to God's people. Right, you have goy, which refers to the nations that sometimes is translated as people, but uh, you know here we we have am. So the, the wise among the people, these are God's people, and they're going to instruct, right, uh, many. Rabin. So the wise among the people are going to instruct many. So that's the, that's having to do with our time. That is the giving of the gospel message, the loud cry message in our history. Now, we actually even had it uh, dealing with the message of July 18, 2020. And that is we took the words instruct many, 995 for um, instruct and many, 7227. We added them together. And we got the number 8222, so 8,222, which is uh, 22 years and 187 days. And if we count from September 11th, 2001, it brings us to March 16th, 2024, which is 700 or which is 77 days after Jeff spoke, the 1260 days from July 18, 2020 to December 3rd. 30th, 2023. So 187 days, 22 years symbolizes 187 2020. And it's five years after March 16th, 2019, um, which we'd have to go back to an earlier footnote to know what that's about. But uh, the point here is that we're connecting this spreading of the truth, this instructing of many, so in the history, that's that's the spreading of the gospel message through the period of the Dark Ages, people like the Lombards and so forth. But we're connecting that to the message of July 18, 2020, not so much about predicting July 18, 2020, but what that symbolizes. So July 18, 2020 symbolizes uh, a message. 
And that's in that numbers instruct many. Now the comment from the chat, Hebrew 26.10 for corrupt. Certainly the horrors of papal persecution during the 1260s show how corrupt its Christianity is. And like its inventor, Satan, militant papists do corrupt by flatteries. And if this fails, by intimidation and coercion. Now notice as well, the digits of that, of the Hebrew 2610 can be rearranged to 1260. Yeah. And also to 216, you know, you can take the digits 216, which is six times six times six. Right. And flatteries is just six short of 2520. Really? Yeah, 2514. Interesting. Now, now when they shall fall, excuse me, now when they shall fail, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Who's going to fail here? It has. It says fail. Go back to it again. I have fall. Okay, fall. You're correct. I copied this directly from what I had, and for some reason it put it there as fail. My. Yeah, yeah well, it's just yeah they you know they have a lot of typos in those uh, documents because you know converts it right okay um okay now when they shall fall they shall be hoping with a little help but many shall cleave to them with flatteries so who's going to fall here well this this word uh fall is um it means to totter or waver uh through weakness of the legs especially the ankle by implication to falter, stumble, faint. Now, so the ones that are, are helped with a little help, we look at that as the work, the earth helping the woman in Revelation chapter 12. So, so I've always taken that this fall, uh, refers to those that are helping with a little help. But, uh, maybe there's some other way to understand this. So there's, so I don't know. I, I don't know who, when, now when they shall fall, it would seem that they shall be hoping with a little help. In English, we would just take it as the same they, but maybe that's not the case. Well, the prior verse, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So yeah. we're looking at a specific group there. Yeah, and it says they shall fall by the sword by flame. So I think that's the same group of people. It's the same word fall. They shall fall by the sword by flame by captivity by spoil many days. And when they shall fall by the sword by flame by captivity by spoil, etc., they shall be hoping with a little help. So that's when the earth helps the woman. Okay. But then it says, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. So, right. and, and I think that those are the fake Christians, but it could be wrong there. But there's, I think that's how we looked at it. Okay. Smith continues. In Revelation 12, where this same papal persecution is brought to be. Hey, don't, move, don't move ahead so quick here. So, so when we, we, here's what we did when we went through this before. He says, now they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. That is the earth in Revelation 12, 16 helps the woman. But many, that is the majority of Christianity, shall cleave to them. That is those such as do wickedly against the holy covenant, God's word. Uh, those who reject the, and, and in our, in our line, it's going to be those that reject the true meaning of biblical interpretation, line upon line, et cetera, with flatteries. And we put the flatteries there as being false education. Okay. So, so during that period of 1260, you know, the earth is going to help the woman, but there is still going to be lots of false Christians, right? That is within Christianity. And part of that is going to be this false education that's going to be promoted within Protestantism, which really comes from Catholicism. 
right? Because Christians are going to start all of these institutions of learning, but they're going to be influenced by Catholic and Greek philosophy. You know, they they don't, and, and we can see how that that would be symbolized as flatteries in the sense of deception, false education. You know, so the giving of degrees and all of those things, you know, getting a, a doctor of philosophy in in theology. <laughs> right? Okay. So so that's the way that, that the Catholic Church you can say it's part of the counter reformation. Uh, but the basis in which uh God's people survived the twelve hundred and sixty years, at the end of that twelve hundred and sixty years, they're then gonna be tested. And it's because of this false education that they're going to fail uh, the test of the Millerite history. Okay. So help me understand something here. Here we have this cleaving to them with flatteries. Now, it's interesting to me that at Andrews University, they offer a program that results in a degree called the Master of Divinity. I mean, that's that's about as disingenuous as you can get. Because how can you become the Master of the Divine? Comment from the chat. Speaking of false education, and a website is given. That's <clears throat> that's something I stumbled across recently. I didn't believe it when someone posted on Facebook. I had to fact check it, and it is true. John Pauline and uh, George Knight and other leading scholars are now denying that Sunday is actually the mark of the beast, um, denying that there's going to be a Sunday law. It's really incredible. Couldn't believe it until I read it. Yeah, and well, then I'm. Well, I know people who are followers of John Pauline and George Knight, and yeah, they don't believe in Adventism anymore. So George Knight, the supposed great historian, doesn't believe in this anymore? Doesn't believe in the Sunday law? Yeah. No, no. I I had the opportunity, actually, to meet George Knight at the Hope Camp meeting one year in B.C. Uh-huh. Uh, and what a guy, boy. He's really quite a grandiose guy. Um, he pontificates. When he speaks, when I went up to him in, in the ABC bookstore to talk to him a little, he was having a book signing. And, of course, you know, I handed him the charts. I handed him maybe Rise and Fall of the King of the North or something. And he kind of politely thanked me and brushed me off. I don't know if he ever looked at that material, but he definitely had it delivered to him. Just a, he's just quite a guy yeah yeah so i mean it, it, we can see that the role of education within what happened with the protestants that the counter-reformation was largely uh, done through education the counter-reformation was really uh, and it was successful right we see that with the failure of the millerite movement and you know, the question is, is it going to be, I mean, I don't believe it's going to be a failure, but that's that's where the controversy ends up in our history. Many Adventists will support a Sunday law as not seeing it as anything to do with Bible prophecy. They didn't see 1989 as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. They didn't see 9-11 as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And so when the Sunday law comes, they're not even going to recognize it as a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Wow. Uh, that really, uh, to me, illustrates calling light darkness. And how great is that darkness? But, but we see it happening. And it's happened in the past. And it's going to happen again. That's happening now. Ellen White speaks to that uh, in uh, 18... Just shortly, 1892, maybe, about, uh, uh, what was it, the religious amendment that was being put forward there about the 
World Fair and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and how people at that time even <clears throat> weren't uh, awake to it. She was, she was uh, stirring them up, I guess, to wake up. Could have happened then, I guess. Now, another comment from the chat. I think little in verse 34 should be translated as soon. In other words, Christians receiving divine help soon in a timely fashion to remain steadfast during papal tyranny. And, and so, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't know about that. In this context, I wouldn't put it as soon. Okay. It can be translated as soon, but that's in a different context when you're talking about time. We're not talking about time here. Okay. Shall we go forward? You have something more to to, to contribute? No. That's okay. In Revelation 12, where this same papal persecution is brought to view, we read that the earth helped the woman by opening her mouth and swallowing up the flood, which the dragon cast, cast out of her. The great, the great Reformation by Luther and his co-workers furnished the help here foretold. The German states espoused the Protestant cause, protected the reformers, and restrained the work of persecution so furiously carried on by the papal church. But when they should be helped and the cause begin to come popular, many should cleave unto them with flatteries or embrace the cause from unworthy motives by be insincere, hollow-hearted, and speak smooth and friendly words through a policy of self-interest. So, in other words, Smith is placing this strictly in the past and does not have any type of a present or future application. He, How would well, he's, not, he's not making a future application, but, right. but his past application is correct. Yeah, he's not looking at that uh, the present truth application because he's not even alive now um so but so i think his is pretty good uh in that verse and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed so here we have fall, purge, make white. Do we have a corresponding reference here within Revelation? Well, that's the message to the Laodiceans. So if Daniel 11.35 is giving reference to the message to the Laodiceans, where is the reference for the message to the Philadelphians? Yeah, well, there's not a... So, I mean, what this is referring to is the three angels' message. So this is Millerite history. Okay. So, because that's... So at the end of the 1260 years, right, it says some of them on understanding shall fall, that is the wise, um, are going to be tested, right? They're going to be tried to purge and to make them white. And we know in Daniel 12, because we looked at this before, uh, we're going to have in verse 10, many shall be purified, made white, and tried. Exactly the same Hebrew words, uh, in, but, but in a different order. They're going to put tried in verse 10, 12 verse 10 at the end of this list of three. But purified is the same word as purged, and made white's the same. Uh, so, so here it's put in this order, right? Because it's going to say that they're going to be tried, right? That That's the third angel's message. And to purge and to make them white. That is, purge is the justification. That's the first angel's message. Make white, that's sanctification, the second, second angel's message. Trying, of course, is judgment. The third angel's message. Now it says, even to the time of the end, now, uh, we, we understand that that's from the time of the end until the time appointed. That's from 1798 to 1844. So that's just simply describing Millerite history. 
And in Daniel 12, where it says, many shall be purified, made white, and tried, but the wicked shall be do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Again, that's going to be referring to the time of the end, 1798, right? Because Daniel's books, the, his words are going to be closed up and sealed to the time of the end, verse 9 of chapter 12. And then and then there's going to be this reference back in chap, Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, back from the time that the daily was taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So again, that's going to bring you to the end of 1843, April 18th. And then, or, or pardon me, to 1798. And then in verse 12, you're going to have the 1335, and that's going to bring you to the end of 1843. 43. So it's going to again refer to that period that we see here in verse 35, the time of the end and the time appointed. So it's going to be Millerite history. Now in Revelation chapter 3, so when we look, now you make reference, to, we don't have the message to the Philadelphians here. Correct. Yeah. Now, so when we look at the message to the Philadelphians, um, we did. We do have references that to that in in Daniel, right? So, Correct. what what were the verses that we connected to the message to the Philadelphians? Do you remember? Not off the top of my head, no. Okay, so that was. You know, I'm trying to remember myself exactly. Um, how did we do that? I didn't write it in my notes. Because we were dealing with the key, right? The key of the house of David. Do you remember specifically? Anybody remember exactly how we did that? Where that was in Daniel? I don't remember now where it was. Hmm. But we do we do have a reference, right? So in somewhere that we had a reference that led us back to Isaiah 22, 22. But I didn't write it in my notes. So now I don't remember. But anyway, so we don't we don't have a reference here. The reference here, the message of the Laodiceans is that three step testing prophetic message. Correct. So so the question is, why do the Laodiceans have to repeat Millerite history? I guess is a simple question that sort of has the answer built in. Because they failed to learn from it the first time. Right. Yeah. So so we know that there's this message to the Laodiceans. And and the question is, why the message to the Laodiceans? You know, behold, I stand at the door and knock, you know, if any man open the door. Now, we know that in the Philadelphian church, there is a shut door and an open door, right? In the message to the Philadelphians, right? And, And it says, you know, the message to the Philadelphians is to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man openeth, right? So that, that's going to be the, the door uh, to the holy place that's going to be shut and the door to the most holy that's going to be open. Well, I remember where we did this study. It wasn't really in this study. It was, um, or was it? I'm trying to remember where we did this study because it was it was a study that I did when I was in Australia. And I think we did it in this study, but we just... Uh, uh, I wish I remembered it. I'm going to have to look back at some of these videos. Yeah, so Daniel 12, verse 1 to 3, the separation of the two classes could have been in connection with that. So anyway, there's going to be this open door that no man can shut. And we know that the key of the house of David, that's Isaiah 22:22. 22, 22. We also connected it to some other verses um, dealing with Peter, right? He's going to be given the keys of the kingdom, right? And that's going to be about binding and loosing, but that's really the same idea. Um, and, 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 and Peter represents, uh, you know, he's going to have the, you know, denying Christ three times. He's going to have three times that Christ asks, do thou, do you love me? The first two times it's going to be agape, third time phileo. So, so we can see that there's this connection between this open and shut door. And a message, right? So in the Philadelphian message, they have a door that's closed and a door that's open, right? And in in, um, 
in the last part of the Philadelphia message, uh, verse 12 of chapter 3 of Revelation, he that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I'll write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Right. So so that's the Philadelphian church. Now, that experience, the Jeff is teaching that we are now Philadelphians and that the Laodicean message doesn't apply to us. Right. Now, it's true that Philadelphian church has no rebuke, but it refers to a specific point in Millerite history, which in our movement would be prior to July 18, 2020. Would we agree with that? If we're going to make an application of the Philadelphian church, we'd have to make it in connection, as Ellen White does, with with uh, the history between the empowerment of the first angel, August 11th, 1844, and the arrival of the third angel, October 22nd, 1844. Because that's, that's where we put the Philadelphian church, right? We don't put the Philadelphian church, um, you know, April 1st, or April 19th, 1844, to October 22nd, 1844. We have the Sardis Church is up to August 11th, 1840, and then the Philadelphian Church, August 11th, 1840, to October 22nd. Do we agree with that? I think the application is logical. Yeah, that, that's how I've understood it. Not not necessarily in all those details. But in, in studying what Ellen White says about Philadelphia, it's that proclamation of the first and second angels messages that the movement was united upon. And, and we had that happen in our history prior to July 18. So to try to say the church is Philadelphia now, when, you know, Jeff just basically excommunicated the Canadian group goes contrary to what he's saying. Right. I mean, obviously they're not Philadelphian. Now, the message to the Laodicean then, it applies to a church that there is a door in in the Philadelphian in, in the Philadelphian church, and there's a door in the Laodicean church. But in the door in the Laodicean church is Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So, and also it has to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So, so there's lots of symbolism in here, but we know that they're going to say they're rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing, but don't know that they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then the remedy, so that we have four, right? And then the remedy is three, right? Gold tried in the fire, that thou mayst be rich. White raiment, that thou mayst be closed. And the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayst see. And if we took these three, they would actually be reversed, right? The tried is first. The white raiment is second. And the eye salve would be equated with, you know, being purified right purged so this is this is the first step justification so in revelation 318 they have them in reverse order of daniel 12 verse 10 so why is that is that to help us see the structure well it's a mirror right there's a mirror aspect to it so now if we think about if we think about millerite history millerite history was sealed up in the seven thunders and it's unsealed in our history and we need to heed the message to the laodiceans now when when this is given he's going to miss mention first the gold tried in the fire why why would that be first i mean what wouldn't he say first anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see because you first need to see and then you, that's justification. You see your sin. You go to Christ for, for forgiveness. And then have, you know, 
and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. That's sanctification. Why? Now that one is second, but why wouldn't you have had anoint thine eyes with eye salve, then the white raiment and then the tribe? Why, why is it not put in that order? Well, just as we come to a vision, a looking glass vision, where we have to look at ourselves, isn't this mirror image directing us to self-reflection? Yeah, okay, right. So we look on to the law of liberty, right? We look at Christ. We have the looking glass vision. So it, it refers to the mirror, to the idea that this message is a mirror. Right. I mean, one of the things that we run into with this, I'm going to call it a problem, but we, we have this problem that this message keeps being pointed to. That is the 2520, the prophetic mirror, uh, the chronology, all of these things that we've been studying. And, and, you know, we're arguing that they're not a test. That is, not everybody needs to understand everything that we're presenting. This, you know, we're going into a type of detail that that isn't necessary for salvation, let's say. I mean, it is necessary for us to understand these things because it's been given to us to study them. Um, but that's not going to be our message. You know, I don't think everything that we studied is going to be like a message that everybody has to receive it, it, in all of its detail. But there are some things that are quite clear, and that is, the, the the message to the Laodiceans is a message about Millerite history, right? So so maybe we should think about this uh, before the study tomorrow. We can jump back into this tomorrow because our time is up. I think we're going to have to. Yeah. So think about that question, what we're studying. Try to think about it today before we come back tomorrow. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions at this point? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this for which we have studied and for which we are currently looking for guidance. We pray for your direction today, Father. I ask a blessing on the brothers and sisters that have attended this message, that have participated in this time together, that you will be with us each one as we go through the day. Guide us now, direct us where you would have us to be. May your will be done. May we more properly represent your character and your word before all with whom we come in contact. Direct us now. For this we ask. For this we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.